Hello, my name is Richard Cox, and I'm joined again by Tim Freak for the latest of our Deep Awake Dialogues. And today, we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Jude Curvin. Uh, Jude is the author of many books. The latest one is The Cosmic Hologram, Information at the Center of Creation. So, good morning to you both. Good morning, Richard. Morning, Tim. Good morning. So we thought this would be a, a good dialogue as um, the similarities and perhaps differences too um, in what you've both tried to do in your most recent works, which is take this kind of spiritual philosophy and see how it relates to a, a scientific um, worldview and expand it in that way. So maybe to get the ball rolling, uh, Jude, you can explain a little bit about your background as a physicist and in spirituality and how you've meshed those worlds together in this latest book. I'll be happy to, Richard. I mean, I think to describe my, my, my journey as a scenic route is probably the, <laughs> the best description. I started uh, experiencing multidimensional realities when I was four years old, but literally at that same time too, I was fascinated by the stars, by the world, by how and why reality is as it is. Of course, I didn't use that language when I was four or five years old, but I was absolutely fascinated by ancient wisdom, uh, by spiritual insights, but also the, the, the sort of the science, how science described the world. And I was also experiencing, I was also walking between worlds from that very early age. So as I grew up, all of those interests and fascinations continued. I did a master's degree at Oxford. Uh, in physics, um, specializing in quantum physics and cosmology. I then took a, a scenic side detour into international uh, business and, and over 25 years became the most senior businesswoman in the UK for about 10 seconds before somebody else <laughs> became more senior. Um, but I ran a couple of, of uh, from a financial perspective, two $500 million turnover businesses. Uh, during that time and traveled the world and and you know continue to have the experiences that I've had since childhood continue to keep abreast of leading edge science uh, and also of course in that role of, of an international corporate uh, role I was working very closely with people who were were looking at sort of social economic financial political systems and my my quest has always been at the deepest level to understand the nature of reality as best I can. And secondly, in understanding that, to be in service to perhaps um, to heal our perspectives, because it seems to me all my life that we have very fragmented in the main, certainly in the West, fragmented perspectives of, of the nature of reality. And so my route now has been to try and, and mesh all that together to gain as deep understanding as I could. After I left uh, business, I also went to do a PhD in archaeology, re researching ancient cosmologies. Because cosmology really is, is, is the nature of reality. It's trying to understand that, not just at the physical level, but, you know, all science, all physical science, all physics understands that we cannot understand what we call the physical world without understanding that it arises from deeper non-physical realms. Um, and so I think it was an incredibly interesting moment where leading edge science is actually coming together and able now, probably for the first time, to fully reconcile with universal spiritual experiences, all the supernormal phenomena such as telepathy and precognition and remote viewing, and bring all that together so that we actually now have the evidence that the duality-based reality we, we seem to, to, to experience is not the fundamental nature of reality. So we're really now on the verge of bringing all of this together. And as, as Tim does so wonderfully in his work, to show that you know um, mind is matter that consciousness isn't something we have it's what we and the whole world are and the the nature of reality is that it is unified innately not just interconnected but ultimately unified so that's an amazing time for all of us because this is just this isn't just a scientific revolution it literally can i feel and and I, I suspect Tim would agree, has the opportunity to transform how we collectively see ourselves in the cosmos and take a major 
step forward in, in our conscious evolution. And, and you feel that the science of physics particularly is, the arrow is pointing in that direction now because I'm aware that, um, for example, a lot of the really famous quantum physicists back in the 30s and 40s um, also were very interested in idealism as a philosophy, the idea of the world being principally arising in mind or thought. And I'm never really sure how much they felt the physics was pointing to that or whether it was a, a separate kind of thing. Do you feel that physics itself is pointing towards this kind of... I do, but I think, I, I think what they did is they, uh, they were absolutely the giants on whose shoulders we now stand. And certainly the quantum physicists, the, 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 more, um, the deeper thinkers amongst them, were realising that the basic way in which quantum phenomena uh, realise themselves means that you know, there is no separation that there's no separation between the observer and the observed and more and more experimentally it's been shown that um, you know quantum behavior is only made real when it's measured or, or in some way but the two things that were not ready I think for them to be able to, 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 to get hold of and bring into the center of this is the nature of information itself because as you say 20th century science sort of revolutionized from the Newtonian perspective of things and separation into excitations and fields and relationships. But by basing the understanding of reality on energy matter, which is what quantum physics does, and space time, which is what relativity does, they missed an enormous and crucial piece, which is information. Because what now physicists, but not just physicists, but biologists, complex systems theorists, information theorists, and many, many others are realizing that actually it's information, that exactly the same digitized information that forms the basis of our technologies is exactly the same as the universal information that is more fundamental than energy and matter and space and time and in fact expresses itself in complementary ways as energy matter and space and time so literally our universe all that we call reality is literally informed and also we're understanding from studies of black holes and the understanding of, of information entropy or the information content of, of systems that our universe is also holographically manifests so in that sense we have some absolutely crucial um, attributes that in the 30s and 40s and, and even 50s were just not known of so that's why it's now that and it's only now i mean literally the evidence mm. has only been in the last few years that this is coming more and more as a compelling appreciation and what it can do, of course, is it can reconcile relativity and quantum theories by showing that, you know, they, they represent complementary expressions of information. So we're now moving to a, a unified perspective, not just of physics and not just of the physical world, but all the way down. You know, it's turtles all the way down on this one, because you can't get to this place and not get to that aha -ness of consciousness isn't something we have, it's what we in the whole world are, which is very much, you know, Tim's pioneering work, I think has done wonders in this. So, you know, we're all in it together and I think it's all converging. <laughs> it's interesting to me because I, I, it's, it, what, the, 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 the thing I love about uh, when I read, here it is, look, by my side, the Cosmic Hollow, oh. um, it is because, uh, you know, I come at this as a philosopher, um, an amateur interest in science and um, I'm always needing to touch base with uh, luckily I have people around me who who are very well informed um, but as a philosopher I, I mean I mentioned the, the in my book soul story when I'm exploring what I call emergent yeah. spirituality I mentioned it in a few lines and what this book does is really brings out all of the reason why that yeah. I can say I think with confidence the leading edge of science is pointing towards the idea that yes. the objective world is is needs to be understood as information, the hologram Absolutely. analogy and on all of that. And I think you're right, see, for, <clears throat> once you can get to the point where it's information, that's yeah. at the point when you can go, so there's information on a physical <laughs> level, which appears as solid objects, there's information on a biological level, which appears as life, and then there's information on a soul level or, or a psych psyche level, which appears as images. And we're exactly. experiencing all of that right now. And there's suddenly a link 
between the hardest physical thing, which isn't what it appears, no. right the way through to the to the to the 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 objects of the mind or of the soul. Yeah, the foundation of being. Mature. And suddenly exactly. there's one spectrum. Yeah. And that's the key because that spectrum, that, that linkage has not been there before. And, and I, th this is, I think, the first of what will be probably many books, but I think this is the first book that's really provided that linkage. And as you say, Tim, it's got the back of everyone who has been doing this amazing work, such as yourself, to show this. And, and, you know, okay, well, I, I want to, in that case, <laughs> I, think, I think I have to pop in because actually I need to disagree with you. Um, oh, uh, okay. Um, on one thing, or, or not, this, you, I, I, because uh, I would say that um, quite a bit of my early work um, does follow what is the, the, the mainstream traditional view, which you get down the ages, of spirituality, which is the it's all in consciousness so it's an indian philosophy yeah. essentially but you get it in gnosticism and and all over sure. as a philosopher the more i've sat with that the more that hasn't worked for me um uh, so uh and and i've been looking for a way of seeing the objective subject split i see i see philosophy as kind of a big battleground between objectivists who are going look the object's real and su and the subject comes from it and subjectivists are going no no consciousness is real and the objects are just appearing in it and my my own sense is more like david bohm or somebody like that who goes mm. no i think we need to see a third element which is before both which gives yes. rise to this duality of subject and object so yes. that the subject and object are arising together and necessarily therefore the idea of just the object without the subject or vice versa I agree. So, so that whilst I feel happy to say this world I'm experiencing is yeah. clearly existing in consciousness, I'm also yeah. aware that there is a informational reality that exists beyond my consciousness. Yes. Uh, uh, in, and is therefore not. It does. It, it, it's hard for me to make sense of the traditional spiritual idea that it's all really, it's all consciousness because consciousness, in terms of self knowledge, seems to be an evolutionary or emergent phenomena. I, I agree with you completely. I mean, my, my definition of consciousness is a very broad church. And within that broad church, having sort of aid in the world for, for you know, over 60 years now, I completely agree with you. And so, you know, my experiences have been in terms of communicating, learning from many different levels of, of consciousness and levels of different levels of self-awareness. But what I suppose I am, you know, my, my sense is, and, and I think we, we share this, and, and by the way, there's no disagreement at all between us. Um, it is really what would Einstein call cosmic mind, the infinite, eternal ground of being within which there are what I'm calling universe souls. You know, our universe exists and evolves as a unified, coherent entity of which we ourselves, the microcosmic, creative, individuated, self-aware bits of that consciousness. Um, but, you know, as, as a finite thought form, as it were within the so mind the, of so the issue that comes to me with with the with that idea of cosmic mind and the big mind the zen idea and all of those things which you know is littered throughout my books you know you can find it <laughs> up until i've read your books you know, I know quite this. recently <laughs> i i certainly would have said you know happy to use those things for myself and then it felt like it felt to me like we need it, it, the danger with use, I mean, I, I also think we're saying the same thing from different perspectives, but there is, a, there is for me, a kind of inherent danger in putting it all arising within cosmic mind, which is the, the spiritual perspective, because it sounds like there's this incredible, it's basically this incredible intelligence, you know, it's God really, which is there. And then it's the cosmos, it's the dream of Brahman. It's like that ancient idea and it's issuing forth. And that's an incredibly attractive idea, apart from, I, can, I absolutely get why so many scientists find it laughable. Because once you see the scope of evolution, well, my favorite example, Jim, is tell me your insights on this. You know, I, 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 as a philosopher, I work in really simple ideas. The <laughs> so the yeah, simple okay. idea for me is, Tim, how the hell do you, if, that, if this is all arising in a cosmic mind and that's a huge intelligence, why do we have 120 million years of dinosaurs? That's nuts. Why would, no, you know, why I, would, I don't, I, but I'm not saying that. I'm not saying it in the way that exactly. you're saying so, so how, how do you see that? That's what I'm trying to get at. What, how do you well, see that? 
what I'm writing in the book is basically that when we perceive that, that physical reality, let's just talk about our universe. You know, we'll, we could talk about multidimensionalities and all the rest of it. Sure. But let's just sort of hardball it on, on our universe. And our universe, the, the moment, the beginning of space-time was around 13.8 billion years ago. And, you know, scientists called it the Big Bang because Fred Hoyle wanted to be derogative about it. But of course, it's, it's, it's a lovely it's irony, great. isn't it? But actually, what cosmologists realize is it, it clearly wasn't big, but it wasn't a bang. It wasn't explosive. It wasn't, you know, just a shrapnel everywhere. It was incredibly fine ordered and, and fine tuned. And, and our universe began with its lowest level of informational content designated in space time. So it had all the energy matter it would ever need to just play around but conserve throughout its lifetime. Sure. But at that first moment, which I'm calling the big breath, because it wasn't a bang, it was an ordered outbreath of space expanding and time flowing. That first moment was the lowest, what's called informational entropy. In other words, the lowest informational content of our universe, it's like a newborn baby, a newborn yeah. baby universe. Yeah. And so the point is that for informational entropy to increase, the physics require essentially that space must expand. Yeah. And the flow of time is, is that accumulated yeah. flow of, of information entropy, that, that increase from the minimum through. So what you get, as space expands, you're able to have greater and greater complexity evolve within the totality of our universe. So, but bear so with me, you, bear with me. Okay, I just um, want to get... Can yeah. I just finish the... Can you re can I just okay, finish sorry, the sorry, 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 Jean. I just want just to know, if it, is, that in, is, that in, is that in a... For you, is this happening in the big mind bear with me i want to finish okay. this thought and then, okay. and then i hope i'll answer that question because okay. it's exactly that so basically within what we call space time what we experience as space time the duality perception of space time the me and the you at the most fundamental is 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 unified in other words mind is matter etc nonetheless there is that perception and from that perception comes the experience and the exploration and the evolution but what happens um entropically is that the rate of the complexity it sort of it skinnies down so instead of the whole of space becoming more intelligent as it were planets after three generations two or three generations of amazingly fine-tuned stellar evolution are able to form with all the ingredients necessary for then the emergence of biological life within space-time so four and a half billion years ago our earth gaia was able to be comprised from all of the the stardust as it were of previous stellar explosions but also with the necessary water and and complexity to then move to the next level of evolutionary complexity and individuation and and, and evolution of self-awareness and you know with us now and, and and on and on so for me if you if you think of cosmic mind as as the sort of the numinous foundation of being then universes such as our own which cosmologists now there's more and more pointing to it's not just it's a closed system and it's a finite in both space and time so our literal universe is born grows rather like a balloon being blown up or a bubble and then at some point and the latest um, astronomical uh, measurements suggest that 95 percent of all stars that could ever form have already formed because there just isn't enough hydrogen to form new stars. So we're at a point probably in our universe where our universe is past middle age as a thought form, as an ever increasing um, playground for complexity, for consciousness to individuate and continue to evolve. So we are coming from it from i think complementary perspectives but you know why is it the, why do you why why do you choose to see that i mean i love that description beautiful description and and the big breath is lovely i call it moment zero because it's for me it's the beginning of the expansion of time very exactly with what you're saying i guess the area which i'm i'm, I'm that we kind of ended up talking about earlier because of, of what you're saying and I, I i said i better confess that that's actually not what i'm saying at the moment is is <laughs> the analogy 
of it being a thought form in a mind. Well, I, I'm experiencing mind right now, and I'm, I, I can, I'm experiencing thought forms. Uh, so it's like that is a, you can see that analogy, but like most analogies, it feels like, is that, you know, because it puts, it puts the mind bit, the, th the, the thing which knows itself to be here. I really liked it when you called it the ground of being. See, that yes. really works for me because that's not a mind. That's not conscious. That doesn't I, know it. That's no, not, I agree. That's no, no, not, no. And then this is, this is not necessarily we don't, what exists in the proto world, that, you know, before sure. there is life. We don't have to imagine that in a mind because minds are going to come later. In fact, what strikes me about the evolutionary process is how we have to wait a long time to get minds. And then yeah, we'll a long time. It's amazing. So mind has come from it rather than it from mind. I think we're I think we're 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 expressing semantics at the moment because as I said earlier, for me and my definition of consciousness is a very, very, very broad church. And it goes way beyond the the, the level of self awareness because what I think you're speaking of is, is absolutely right, is that progressive evolution of beings such as ourselves that have a level of self awareness. And you know, I, I as I say I've experienced many, many levels of elemental consciousness, of archetypal consciousness, all through my own explorations. And you're, you're absolutely right. So what you term mind, I'm sort of perhaps reflecting back a self-aware mind. And for me, and I'm happy to go ground of being, I'm happy to use different terminology. I'm happy to call, you know, God, I'm happy to call it Jabba the Hutt. I, you know, it, I, I think the danger, the danger is we get caught upon the Tower of Babel of semantics when actually we're all coming and, and, and probably experiencing and it's that deep experiencing. Um, that I think, I think it, does, it does matter though, I think, Jada, I think the reason it matters is not because of semantics. I think what, what the job for us, and I mean literally you and me and people like us, sure. it feels that like if this is going to be a new thing, yes. then what we need to do is we need to find ways of expressing it accurately because the great thing about science is that it, it, it is learnt through peer, peer review <laughs> <to express laughs> Indeed. clearly. So that Indeed. one scientist in Japan can express the same thing or disagree about it with a scientist in Peru. And it sure. feels like what we need to do in spirituality is we, whilst I think, personally, I use loads of words for different things. To, uh, and exactly. And do it for, for the same reason as you are. Um, yeah. But it does feel like, you know, if we can, if we can actually, it, it, it's not the words that matter, it, but it is what we mean by them. I agree um, with you. And, and, and I, and we, I meet a lot of people that when you, because I'm very popular at the moment, everything exists in consciousness who see that like it's well it's god really it's this big all benign thing which has created the whole thing and um, and there's problems with that um i agree, I agree. And, and and somehow we need to find a way of saying this so we can I, get so we can bring the scientists on board because actually otherwise this is always going to be a uh, it's not going to be mainstream <laughs> I think I, I think that's very important, and it's it's an interesting um, timing because I've been having loads of conversations lately on this Tower of Babel aspect of it. That you know, a convergence of terminology is key. Yeah. There's a very good reason that I called the subtitle of the Cosmic Hologram "In Formation at the Centre of Creation," because I could have gone very onomatopoeic and said "Consciousness at the Centre of Creation," and I've very clearly didn't because science is now at the information stage all the science i lay out in the book is realizing that information is the most fundamental is yeah. the fundamental nature of a physical reality as it's the first book of trilogy i think i mentioned the transformation trilogy so i'm moving into the c word and exploration of the c word multidimensionally as i go through the next two books but in a way, I personally, I, I don't really, I see it as part of my role to bridge, you know, and bring all this together. But what my passion doesn't extend to are long debates about the terminology. Um, and what I prefer to do with folks is to co-create a field of coherence so that it, we we each get it i mean i've been doing a lot of coherence i, I think that's right you but i just want to say <laughs> i don't think any of this is about terminology is it isn't it about saying whatever we call it, it is. 
what is the ground? Is the ground self-aware? Is it consciousness because it knows itself? Is it a potentiality from which everything emerges? Is the, does it become conscious of itself? These don't, that's not terminology. That's like going, no, it is isn't. But, it, but I think that's where you and I, I mean, you are a philosopher. A philosophy is lover of truth. I'm a philosopher. But I also am a philosopher in a sense of, I think those questions are key. My feeling is that those questions have been debated for a very long time and explored for a very long time. And one of the things that we've not had until now is the, as you said right at the beginning, is the bridge that bridges between what we experience and perceive as physical reality, which seems to be very duality-based, which seems to be separate and all the rest of it. We've never had the evidence until now that that is not the true nature of reality. The book does that, but the yeah. book then offers that, that grail, as it were, that, that container of, of, it's got your back now, now start to have these conversations and let's start to come together in, in these very important explorations. But beyond, you know, beyond doubt, you know, so we can find ways of coming together more coherently and finding, new ways of understanding this. I feel like a three-year-old at the school gates. You know? <laughs> and it's like, okay, guys, right, we, we've got the evidence now. It's, it, the science is completely reconciling with universal spirituality and supernormal phenomena and, and, and all of it. Now what? And I wrote an article called, what if, what then? And I think we've got the, we're saying, yes, it's here now. Now what? What do we do with this? What do we do as, as, you know, spiritual beings, divine beings, having a human experience? What well, about me and the we and the bigger we as a result of this? 